have kind of a special thing going on here today at the Drury Outdoor Studios. We're coming to you live uh, with a special edition of the Drury Outdoors 100% Wild podcast. Uh, we have a, a panel here that we put together to discuss CWD. Of course, that's something that's been a really hot topic for quite some time. It's not something new. I mean, it's been a hot topic, and, and it seems like it's getting more prevalent as far as discussion goes uh, with, with among hunters across the country. So we've assembled a panel here. Of course, we have Mark and Terry Drury at Drury Outdoors. Uh, I'm Matt Drury, and we have Barb Keller, who is the Servid Program Supervisor at the Missouri Department of Conservation. We have Jason Sumner, who is the Resource Science division chief there at the MDC and then we have joining us via Skype uh, Dr. Grant Woods who of course uh, is a wildlife biologist has a PhD in deer behavior and management over 25 years of experience he has a weekly uh, online show called growingdeer.tv and he's kind of our go-to source for any of our questions that we have about our herds so uh, welcome everybody to uh, this Facebook live here yeah thanks, thanks for, for having us yeah, absolutely. Grant, welcome. Thanks, guys. So, you know, and, and, and wanting to have this discussion, of course, uh, back in March, uh, Mark and Terry were a part of a, uh, a conversation there in Jefferson City in Missouri with uh, the MDC, with QDMA, Heartland Bow Hunters. And Grant, were you there as well? I wasn't able to make that one. Okay, so uh, it was about this topic and, and trying to work with some of the influential uh, people within the hunting industry to try to help get the word out about CWD, to help educate, and because there's there's so much information out there as, as you're just kind of regular hunter, myself included, it's like, how do I sift through it to understand what's true, what's fake news, what's you know, how do you go about uh, managing uh, with kind of CWD cloud over your head, managing your deer herd? And so um, we're hoping that this kind of allows the MDC and, and uh, Grant to get some factual information based on studies that, that have been out there, uh, out to the public. And of course, by the end of this thing, we want to allow the public a chance to throw out some of their questions and, and some of the hard hitting questions, good, bad, and different, whatever Jason and, and Barb and Grant are here to answer all that stuff. And, um, I'll let Mark kind of take it from there. Absolutely. It really comes down to the resource and how much we care about the resource. And I think once you look at the facts and some of the things that we're going to share with you today, you'll understand our concern, Grant's concern. We're all people that love whitetail deer. And uh, when the MDC approached us and said, hey, would you guys help be a vehicle just to educate people? We said, absolutely, because I think everybody really needs to see what's going on out there. And it's, it's a topic that goes, uh, it gets very hot and very quickly. And I think really it's just because people don't necessarily have all of the education. You guys can certainly help provide that. And uh, we're not saying this is our opinion, but we are saying that we care about the resource and we definitely want to help educate people to some of the same stuff you shared with us. And Grant and I had a conversation the other day and we said, you know what, this isn't. It's nothing benefiting anyone's companies or anything like that. It's about how much we love whitetail deer, the sport of whitetail deer hunting, and we can only grow through education. You know, this will, this will I think, uh, give some people an opportunity to ask those questions that they haven't had. And I know, you know, we run in circles with guys that all they do is live to hunt. And uh, they've got a lot of questions about CWD, and they want to get answers, and they want accurate information, and they want answers that will help them down the road and maybe be able to help the overall uh, herd health. So I think giving them a platform to ask the questions is very, very important. And let's be honest. I mean, I think almost all the DNR agency or agencies are kind of under fire right now from the public perspective and, and what your approach is. And, and those are some of the questions we want to ask you guys and, and, and get a better understanding. Why are you doing it this way or that way? And, and it allows you to kind of share that directly to uh, the viewer at home. So um, and why does one state's approach differ from others? Yeah. And so hopefully we can answer some of those questions. Yeah. So to kind of kick it off, we, we started last week and put a question out on Facebook just saying, hey, you know, if you had a chance to, to ask 
MDC or, or a wildlife biologist about CWD, what would it be? And we kind of use that as our guideline to go through this deal here. And the first one we felt like we'd start with would just be what is CWD and, and how does it affect deer? And, and we have a question coming in from Gabe uh, M via Facebook. What does CWD do to a deer? Does it just rot the deer from the inside out? And I figured this would be a jumping off point to allow you guys to explain it and then kind of go next up further from there. All right. So, yeah, I can begin with that one. Um, So CWD is chronic wasting disease. It's a pretty unique disease in that it's not caused by a virus or a bacteria or a fungus. It's caused by a protein called a prion. This is actually a misfolded prion. Um, Everybody, we all have normal prions in our bodies. Deer do as well. Um, and they don't cause any problems. But when one of these misfolded prions um, gets into the deer, it interacts with those normal prions and causes them to misfold as well. And they just accumulate like that, accumulate and accumulate. Eventually they accumulate so much they cause cell death. And because these prions accumulate in the central nervous system of the deer, they cause spongy areas in the deer's brain and spinal column, and eventually that causes the deer to die. Unfortunately, that does take a long time to happen. It does have a long incubation period. It can be as much as, or many as 18 months before, be, from when that deer is infected until it dies. Or I'm sorry, until it starts showing clinical symptoms. Um, but it can only be three months before that deer starts shedding infective prions in its saliva and in its urine. And this is an infectious disease, so those infected those infective prions can then cause other deer to become infected through contact with, with the deer um, from infected saliva or urine, or also it can also infect the environment with those infective saliva and urine as well. And so a deer can just come across an environment that has been Um, contaminated with those prions and pick up that disease as well. And unfortunately, the disease is 100% fatal, so there's never been a case of a deer having been infected with this disease and recovering from it. Grant, do you have anything to add on your end? Yeah, no, I think Barb was exactly right. And one thing I will note, in, in the western states, some of these deer that are infected in the later stages are often killed by predators. So actually, the mortality may be higher than we realize because mountain lions specifically key in on deer to show signs of not being alert and take them down. Anything to add? Well, yeah, I mean, that long incubation is the one that most folks say. They say, well, I see healthy deer, and a lot of the deer that that get sampled end up being healthy-looking deer that have just, it takes that long time period, about 18 months, as Barb said, before they actually succumb to the disease. You know, it it affects the the central nervous system and basically inhibits their ability to forage. They just lose neurological control, so they starve to death. And it's a horrible way for, for an animal to die. And then, yeah, the, the research set certainly shows that predation is a really high rate of, of mortality, but there's probably a lot of overwinter mortality, too. And so they go from that looking healthy to dead in about four to six weeks. It, it then progresses pretty quickly. You know, I'm going to jump into this topic real quick, but Barb touched on the fact once it's, you know, infected, then all of a sudden you start talking about saliva and urine. Immediately that transmission is an issue there. You know, we talked briefly about it prior to, but transmission, I think uh, every, that's one of the biggest questions is how it's transmitted. So right. it's trans, yeah, it's transmitted directly from those live animals to one another. The deer are social animals, and so they groom, especially within their little social units. That that adult female and her offspring, or yearling males, or whatever, they're going to interact a lot. Constant. And so there's there's pretty clear evidence that that's probably the way they transmit it early on. Follow up question to that, and it's one I hear all the time. People get confused between CWD and EHD. Yes. Can you clarify that, and then talk about why one is a much greater threat long term than than the other? Because you hear a lot about EHD, and you see it seems like a lot more dead deer from EHD than you do from CWD. Certainly. But yet CWD is the one that gets all the attention. Yeah. Please, uh, right. you know, talk about that. Yeah, a couple of key differences here. Um, Hemorrhagic disease is not always fatal. It's not 100% fatal. CWD is 100% fatal. Hemorrhagic disease is, sp- is a virus, and it's spread through a, a biting midge. And so the midge bites one deer that has EHD and then bites another deer that has EHD, and that's the way that the virus is transmitted. Um, important to note that that midge has to be there for that transmission to take place. 
And so there's a certain amount of seasonality associated with hemorrhagic disease outbreaks. And once um, we have a hard freeze and those midges die, the transmission of that disease um, ends as well. Um, deer can also become resistant if they don't initially die from that virus, then they are resistant to subsequent infection with that virus. And so you can build a sort of uh, immunity in your herd over time as they are exposed to the virus. Another important point is some recent research has shown that mothers pass oh. antibodies of that virus to their fawns. Mm -hmm. And so for that fawn's first initial season, where, you know, first initial summer, it has protection against EHD. And so some of those factors obviously mean that EHD is a little bit less of a concern than chronic wasting disease because it's not 100% fatal, it's not spread directly from deer to deer, and it is seasonal in that, um, you know, once, the, once we have a hard freeze, the outbreak ends, and that deer population can then recover from the outbreak. We see no evidence that um, CWD, um, that deer can recover from CWD. All, all that we've seen where the disease is present is that it increases in prevalence and spreads over time. We've never seen a deer population um, recover from CWD or for prevalence to stay the same or decrease from CWD if nothing is done. Which therein lies the problem. Yeah, exactly. The transmission is always occurring. As long as there's a live animal that has the infection on the landscape, especially when we're dealing with low prevalence like what we have here in Missouri, then yeah, those animals are continually, potentially passing it to each other throughout the entirety of the year. And then when we get at those real high prevalence rates and you got a bunch of infected deer on the landscape and they're depositing prions back onto the landscape, then that environment becomes a real huge source of potential further infection. So you guys showed us some graphs uh, that kind of further stated the case there. Is there one that we can put up here that would make sense for this part of the conversation? On the prevalence? Well, Probably yeah. Nationwide prevalence. Yeah, certainly, you know, we, we've seen the disease spread nationally. And, and if we put up the map with the USGS that shows in those darkest gray boxes, kind of that area in northeastern Colorado and southeastern Wyoming that was endemic. That's the first places that, that we started to see it. And we, and we frequently hear, well, it's been out there for a long time. Yeah, it was, it was first identified probably in the late 1960s, early 1970s. Uh, but it was in very isolated parts of those two states. Since that time, we've seen it spread pretty significantly geographically across the Great Plains, across the, you know, the front range of the Rockies. And then as captive cervids have been moved across the landscape, we see positives uh, popping up in the captive cervid industry. So, mm -hmm. so we see that spread, but then within a state, you know, we can certainly pull up the, the prevalence graphs with Wisconsin and, so, and show that, you know, in early 2000, you know, they had two to three percent prevalence, and now they're dealing with 150 square mile areas where they got 50 percent prevalence in adult males, which is starting to get pretty scary. Well, that I graph is up now. And unfortunately, now they they regularly see in, the, in those core areas in Wisconsin, they regularly see deer sick from CWD. It does take you know fairly high prevalence until you're seeing sick deer on the landscape. And when it gets to that point, you know that there's a lot of environmental transmission occurring, and there's really little you can do management-wise to try to control and prevent spread of the disease. Okay. Some so of the graphs you that you'll see we'll eventually put within the comment section. Yes. We'll post them under Drew Outdoors. That way you can sit and study them later at your, at your your you know on your own time. Yeah, so from a yeah. population standpoint, the stuff we're seeing in Wisconsin that's of real concern isn't necessarily the bucks, while we're greatly concerned about how that will impact age structure and the ability of bucks to mature into older age classes and you know express their potential. It's really that was increasing prevalence in adult females. You know, they're at 30 35 percent prevalence in the adult female segment of the population and we set a target of probably 25 percent of our adult females being removed every year to keep stable populations so with mortality and with hunter harvest if if we remove 25 percent of our adult females we've got stable populations so now you've got a disease that's 100 percent lethal and present in 35 percent of your adult females it's mathematically impossible for the population to do anything other than decline that's just the reality of it. And, but it takes time to get there. You know, they're two decades in or more to the disease being on the landscape there. I think we need to address that a lot of people reflect back on the 2012 EHD outbreak and men are finding deer creeks and ponds and smelling them, whatever. And that was tragic. I, I know Mark and, and my farms both hit hard during that time. We lost about a third of our deer herd at my farm. But now we can't kill enough does. Deer herds have a five-decade history of returning from EHD. 
There's zero history of returning from CWD. That's just real world practical way to look at it. So for five decades, we've studied and known EHD and deer herds always bounce back. With CWD, it goes the other way. So what are some of the more recent discoveries related to CWD? Is there, you know, new studies or new research out there that, that you guys can share? I'd say some of the most, um, from a manager standpoint, some of the best stuff is just the increased sensitivity of some of the testing that we're able to do. You know, one of the huge holes is that it takes a long time to be able to detect the disease in a deer. You know, we, we'll talk from a human health standpoint that, you know, there's never been uh, a human known to be infected with the disease. And so CDC's recommendation is to test a deer, you know, in endemic areas before consuming them. But we can't guarantee that prions aren't present. And part of it gets back to the, the challenge of just detecting the disease. So there are, there's a lot of work coming out in terms of how, how can we create more sensitive tests. Um, sure, the desire to be to have one that we could test live animals, we're not to that point. But, but there are some new methodologies that are allowing us to, test, to detect them at earlier stages of infection, which I think is, is going to be really helpful um, in terms of, from a management standpoint, making sure we're not missing potentially infected animals out there on the landscape. And there's a real important point that we don't want to get just passed by. There is not a good live test right now. We cannot say a deer herd is CWD free because there's no good live test. So it's never safe to ship deer because we don't know for certain that deer herd doesn't have CWD. To that point, there was a graph you shared with us. Which graph so we could put that up where it showed, was it the PA one where it kind of showed where all they went throughout the state yeah yeah there's a there's a, a pretty, few graphs there yeah, there's yeah. a pretty good graph that shows the the movement of um mostly white-tailed deer but captively held animals in pennsylvania and just the amount of exchange that occurs between herds and how frequently that occurs i think it would surprise um folks the the amount of movement that occurs within that industry and, and that was cap the captive deer yes. industry yes. and pa yeah. okay and then on a national level did you guys have one that showcased was it coming out of wisconsin where all wisconsin hunters ended up going or yeah so as we try to paint the picture of how this disease spreads across the landscape well you know it really occurs in in, in one way it's it's movement of deer and so it's either the movement of live deer or dead deer and so the way live deer are going to move across the landscape or even other surveys, because we got to throw in elk and they had a reindeer test positive in Illinois here just recently. So pretty much any survey, any member of the deer family is the movement of live animals. Well, that's in the back of a trailer um, or that's kind of their natural dispersal across the landscape. We know they can move a lot farther, a lot faster in the back of a trailer. Um, they're going to move across the landscape slowly. And that's what we see um, with that, that kind of that USGS graph of the gray boxes, just kind of that slow natural spread. Uh, and then the other way they can spread is, is hunters unintentionally uh, moving carcasses across the landscape and then improperly disposing of them, shooting a deer in, in Adair County. And so we put together some maps that show um, the home zip codes of folks who harvested deer in Adair County last year. Um, and looked at the distribution of those as a potential source of spreading the disease. So if somebody goes to Adair County, they're from Cooper County, they got 40 acres and they bring it back and they process it in the barn and they throw the carcass out in the ditch behind the house. Well, you now potentially have introduced the disease. If that, if that animal was infected, you've now moved those prions. Okay, so how would that happen? Throws it in the ditch, then the prions do what to get into the herd there in that county? It would, it would contaminate the environment and the soil and the plants there. It might be that scavengers come and pull it apart, um, exposing the, you know, the highest concentrations are going to be in the brain and spinal column. But prions are also uh, present in the muscle tissue as well. So they're present in most of the parts of the body. So pretty much as that decomposes, it's just going to affect the soil. Unfortunately, there's been research that's shown that clay types of soils actually increase the infectivity of the prions. So what might not have been a infective dose um, of prions, if it interacts with clay, it can then become an infective dose. Yeah, so it's pretty complicated. Um, but yeah, that's an another one of the unfortunate uh, realities of, of the disease. So yeah, just placing that carcass out there as it decomposes, it can infect that environment. Another deer comes along, um, has contact with that soil, and it can become infected. So what's the best thing that you could have done to have disposed of that, that deer? 
Well, the best thing and the, you know, the thing we're trying to get folks to do is simply change their behavior. You know, it's, it's pretty easy to skin and bone out a deer and leave that, the, the, the waste parts of the carcass on the property that, that it was harvested on or very close there locally. You know, if you do have, you know, you're, you're traveling home, you don't live where you hunt, you know, again, it's the proper disposal of it really that is the challenge. And so double bagging them and send them to the landfill, there's quite a bit of research that shows most permitted landfills, the way they function, will go ahead and sequester and hold those prions, at least reasonably hold them. Um, so, yeah, we just, the biggest thing is, is don't move the carcass a long distance and dump it back out on the landscape. Mm-hmm. It's good information. Pretty there. simple, really. That yeah. kind of takes us to the next section that we wanted to cover here: was how can CWD impact deer hunting? So, is CWD harmful to humans if a deer has it and humans eat the deer? And that was from Lance Young via Facebook. So, that's an yeah. active source of research. You know, CDC's actively involved in assessing status to to humans. They've looked. They've done. Um, you know, they'll, they'll consistently say there's no evidence the disease has been transmitted to humans. Um, there's a number of work on humanized mice and, and all kinds of other models um, to try to see if there's the potential for it to be transmitted. You know, the other thing I think that's important is that they look at the human form, crutchfeld jakobs disease, and they've been looking at the, the, the occurrence rate of that in endemic areas like in Colorado and Wyoming and now in Wisconsin and are monitoring that to see are we seeing anything that looks different here than it looks different in places where the disease doesn't exist. So there's there's active concern um, that there's potential. Um, they're unwilling to say that there's no risk of it being transmitted, but at this point there's no evidence that it has. I don't know that I'd want to eat one if I knew it would test it positive. Yeah, if you, you had know, a positive honestly. test, would you eat it? No, and and that's the guidance, you know, that's the, it's the abundance of caution kind of principle that, you know, don't, you know, we have the disease, it's still at very, very low prevalence, I think there's relatively low risk that that most of us are going to encounter a CWD positive deer at this point, unless we're in one of those spots right now where it's been detected, and then yeah, the the responsible thing to do is, is to test them. But again, back to that detection probability and why it's important for the more sensitive test is that um, we can't definitively say that the deer didn't have the disease. And, and you talk to the, the professionals that work on, you know, the health side of it, and they'll say it's either detected or not detected. It's you, not that it was negative. It's that we failed to detect it. Uh, so it's a, a very important distinction. Yeah, that's a distinction for sure. Yeah. You know, you were, you were talking about controlling prevalence. It, it would seem that uh, I'll use Illinois and Wisconsin, the two, two states that uh, it seemed like it popped up first or, or we were more aware about states that were a little bit closer. Both were big, big deer hunting states when we found out about it. Were their strategies uh, vastly different in their approach to control prevalence? And then was that influential on, on what Missouri did as far as uh, trying to come up with a strategy to control prevalence? Yeah, their strategies are very different. I, w- I would well, I would say initially they weren't terribly different. In that Wisconsin, uh, when they first found the disease, did implement a pretty intensive, wide scale targeted culling kind of program. But it was broad scale culling. They had, I mean, they had the disease distributed over a few counties, um, and so the enormity of the challenge kind of got the best of them with a lot of resistance with a, no lot doubt. Of, with a lot of resistance and so the mid 2000s they completely backed away from that program but what illinois the situation in illinois was that they were dealing with a little bit earlier stages of infection and that the disease was kind of showing up in little pockets and so they took a, a very a localized targeted culling approach through through intensive mandatory sampling um and then localized culling where they knew the disease existed. So basically drawing a one or two square mile area around those positives and going in there, liberalizing regulations, but then following the hunting season, trying to remove those social groups. Again, back to what we were talking about transmission is from, from female to her offspring mm-hmm. and those individuals that interact with one another. So that's our goal. That was, they've shown to keep stable relatively stable or low prevalence and so when we were trying to figure out what to do we we modeled the illinois approach which is my question is there a difference in the herds now barb uh given the two different approaches yeah very much there's uh, some research that has shown you know looking at the prevalence in both of those areas 
when uh, Wisconsin stopped their targeted culling, I believe it was in 2007, they saw a dramatic increase in prevalence from that point. Um, whereas if you look at Illinois, who continued their culling programs, their prevalence has stayed relatively uh, stable. Certainly they've seen some geographic spread of the disease, which is to be expected, but as far as prevalence is concerned, they've been able to maintain that relatively low. So that really demonstrates how, you know, because prior to that, Wisconsin and Illinois prevalence rates were similar, but you can really see uh, the difference once Wisconsin stopped their management program. Mm -hmm. So, Grant, why are we seeing so many different approaches from state to state, in your opinion? Well, you got to remember, this was 15, 20 years ago, and not much was known about the disease. And then a big factor is the local politics. The people in Wisconsin really tired quickly of the culling or herd reduction efforts. It was something new. No one wants to hear, hey, we want to reduce the deer herd on your property by a large percent. And Illinois, the, the government, I think the agency there did a little bit better job of working with the public and explaining why we need to do this. And these are steps we're going to take. And it's on a, a limited scale if we can get on it now. And I think they quite candidly sold it a little bit better. And then there's other states, Kansas, Arkansas, that it kind of crept up on them and it got rolling before they got the public involved. And they're in a mess right now, to be candid. Do we have do we have those graphs available? That one of the prevalence, by chance? I'm not sure. Joe will have to pull it up if he has it there. That was a, a huge eye opener for for Mark and I when we saw those graphs of the prevalence of some of the surrounding states. I was shocked, really was. And and you know this is one of those things, Grant, where it's kind of out of sight, out of mind. If the yes. if the little local herd in your area does not have uh, CWD at this point, you think it will never happen to you kind of thing? Absolutely. You so, know, it's kind of like Noah's Ark. <laughs> to put a, a story we all know, uh, Noah cried flood, 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 and no one listened. And then it was too late once the flood got there. And with CWD, uh, we need to be very positive now, support research, do what we can, and take the appropriate steps where necessary so we don't end up with a 20, 30, 40% prevalence rate in the, the landscape has the prions everywhere, and there's just not a lot we can do at that time. Well, I think Mark started by talking about how passionate we all are about about whitetail deer hunting, and and I guess it boils down to how can I help as an individual, and or okay, if it isn't in my region, why do I care? That we get that you know we get that uh, mindset quite frequently. We hear that very often. Yeah, I have two things. I'll share that just two primary things we all can do, no matter what our job is, no matter what we can do. We can all work towards the stopping of transportation of live servants for any reason except dedicated research. I mean, sure enough research. And the second thing we as hunters can really do is stop moving deer parts. I like to hunt. I like to travel and hunt. But I deboned where I, where I harvested the deer, elk or whatever, or, you know, on that area, that property, that county, whatever. And I bring home, you know, the antlers, if it's an antlered animal, and the pelt and the meat. But I'll leave the spinal column, the brains, and everything else right there on site. Those two steps are big steps in slowing the spread and distribution of CWD. That first step, though, I mean, that one that one gets tough, does it not? I mean, that's, that's a I'd like for him to repeat, task, repeat yeah. that one, if he would. <laughs> Thanks for putting me on that seat, guys. We, we need to stop, in my opinion, I, I believe based on science, based on really good research, all movement of, of deer or cervids, all, all the deer family. We need to stop movement of all deer except for dedicated research because there is no, the reason that is, there's no effective live test right now. We can move a deer that we doesn't we don't believe has CWD, but we cannot ensure it doesn't have CWD. And I, I would not want to move a CWD positive deer to my farm. Mark wouldn't want to move it to his farm. <laughs> Jason wouldn't want it where he hunts. Why would we risk that anywhere? Yeah, you know, I, I'm surprised there isn't a, a test for that, meaning to to somehow identify that prion. That that doesn't exist, huh? It doesn't exist, and it and it partially goes back to what Barb started out describing the disease itself. It's not a virus, not a bacteria, it's not a fungus. And these prions are something that, from a scientific standpoint, only the last decade have we started to really unravel what they are and what they yep. mean. And so a lot of the new advancements that we see in terms of detection, in terms of how do they function biochemically, is in the medical world 
where they're looking at, you know, the human forms of, you know, Crutchfeld Jacobs. And some of that, again, spurs off the tail end of the concerns over BSE and Mad Cow. But from a scientific standpoint, they're tremendously difficult to detect. Wow. So they can't, a lot of times, even to, to diagnose, you know, Crutchfeld Jacobs in humans, which occurs randomly at what I think about one in a million or something like that. Yes, um, yes. It, it's after death. It's it's examining the brain that they go ahead and then definitively say, yep, that's what you had. Mm-hmm. So prions themselves are, are kind of this, you know, alien kind of deal that just the scientific community has a hard time wrapping their arms around. To, to follow up on what Grant said there, I, I and I'm monitoring the, the Facebook live feed as questions come in, just kind of paying attention to it. A guy by the name of Michael Stewart says, so if we kill an infected deer and we skin and quarter it up in the county we killed it and we leave it in that county that does nothing to help our deer herd because you said it will continue to infect the herd so what are your thoughts on that yeah take that one step further it's you know again we don't know the deer don't show signs of being infected with cwd till the very last stages of the disease so you could kill a deer that's had cwd for 12 months and it looks like a perfectly healthy boone and crockett buck so it's just not practical to eviscerate every single deer and take it to the landfill. But if you're in an area that has a high prevalence of CWD, a really good safety step is to take the remains of the carcass and put it in a certified landfill. Those have liners and are built so nothing leaches out. And it's not 100% certain. We all hear of landfills leaching every now and then. But in some type of disposal system like that, because research has shown you can cook these prions at 2,000 degrees for an extended period of time, and they're still infected. You can soak them in chlorine or a really strong agents like that, and they're still infected. So it's not as easy as saying, hey, I'm going to put some gas on there and burn the carcass. That's probably not going to take care of it. Yeah, the other side of that is we hear folks say, well, I'll just cook the meat. It'll be fine. No, it won't. It, uh, yeah, you no. know, they're, they're, it's not like, again, they're not like other things we're typically used to dealing with where viruses or things. Ah, make sure the meat's well cooked. Nah, this doesn't apply with CWD. So to his question, though, he's saying disposing of it there, if, if by chance it was positive, it's still hurting the deer within that area. So, But it's already but there no. on that landscape, Mark, and there's already deer shedding those prions. So we're doing the very best we can. It's again, it's not can, practical yeah. for the millions of deer killed in america to all end up in a landfill that's just not practical right gotcha one additional step you could take is to bury that carcass as well and that's not going to completely eliminate the prions or infectivity but it will decrease a deer coming into contact with that carcass um, or at least the, the portion of that soil where those prions would be Very good. Contaminated. a follow-up to that uh, and, and i forget where i saw it here and what the name of the guy that left the comment but they they asked about you know a uh, 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 coon or a coyote or something that might get into that and can they spread it can they get it they're wondering are other animals uh susceptible to getting cwd and carrying you know stuff no like there's no evidence that they can get it themselves uh there's been work that you know that the prions can be passed through the you know digestive tract of crows and other scavengers the prions don't break down in that system but the animals themselves aren't necessarily getting infected by it so so we often get questions about well how does that what role do they play in spreading it yeah they might they might move the disease but they only move it as far as they go till the next time they do their business right so it's very very limited in that whole role it's about the reality of how many infected deer are out there on the landscape already so the carcass question really kind of comes to a head when you're dealing with well maybe we just found the first one maybe we just got a few then maybe removing some of those carcasses might have some minimal benefit but as long as there's still live infected deer out there transmitting it on the landscape then worrying about what the, whether that carcass goes back onto the landscape locally is is pretty low risk. It's the, it's not moving it somewhere else and introducing the disease where it where it wouldn't otherwise get to is the real concern of carcasses. So, uh, how many deer has the MDC found that have died from CWD? Hugh Kelly asked this question. And that's a question we frequently get, and we've not found any. 
but it's difficult to find deer. I mean, how many deer do we find that are dead anyway? We find a portion of the deer that die of VHD, and that's because they're concentrated around water holes, but they're deer that die of natural causes all the time that nobody ever finds. They waste away really fast. During the summer, a deer can go from a whole carcass to just gone in a matter of days. And so, yeah, we don't know of any because we haven't, detected them falling over dead but we do know it kills deer and if you do find one you're not going to get tested more and more than likely if i find a right. dead deer i'm not right. going to go oh i need to get this tested yeah you know, we cause, hope because there's so many would. other yeah there's yeah, so many other causes they would. Yeah, yeah we absolutely hope that w- that we would but we're in such early stages of infection and have relatively few deer on the landscape i mean there's the first one of the first positives they found in arkansas was a report that they got they called and the lady said hey got a sick deer laying in, in the yard and by the time they got there, the deer was dead, and it tested positive. positive. There are cases of that in, in Wisconsin as well. So we definitively know that the disease kills deer. Just because we haven't found a dead one that subsequently had CWD doesn't instantly make the disease something that we've made up and is right. of serious concern. Grant, do you have anything you would like to add to that? Yeah, there's actually a case in Mississippi, actually, where a hunter – watched a deer lay down and you know act abnormal in front of his stand and so he got close and he actually called the agency and that deer died in front of him and it tested positive for cwd i mean he he watched this deer expire and it was a buck and that was actually the first known case of cwd in mississippi so you go from a, a whole state not showing it to a guy actually watching a hunter watching a deer expire from cwd what's the prevalence in mississippi do you know very low right now. Jason, it, you may know more than I do, but well, very, that, very low. Yeah, that's the only, the only one they've detected yeah. so huh. far. Um, really unique situation. You know, it's right along the Mississippi River, and so they they had this situation occur, and then shortly thereafter, spring floods set in, and, and about half the surveillance area that they would like to have looked at was it's underwater. underwater. Right. But they have done some additional oh. uh, targeted surveillance Um uh, Louisiana, right across the border, has done some additional surveillance as well, and so they'll continue to monitor that. But to this point, that's the only known oh, positive darn. they have. Uh, at this point, I think let's get into a few more questions, kind of rapid fire, and and, and try to wrap everything up and uh, hear from the public and just kind of see what their thoughts are. And I'll try to find a few or, that you know you kind of see all the time or hear all the time uh, and, and go from there. So. Uh, Steve Gerhardt, uh, is there any possible way to stop CWD? If not, why not just let nature take its course? They all eat out of their same kitchen, so to speak. So let's work harder at controlling the things that can be controlled. So the biggest one there is, is if it can't be stopped, why not let nature take its course? I see that all the time. Yeah, well, again, we know there's no genetic resistance. Uh, we know there's no immunity, um, so relying on the herd evolving some immunity, I don't think at this point in time is probably a reasonable or responsible strategy. We also know there's things we as humans are doing that are making the problem worse, or at least potentially moving, making it worse. So again, the things we were talking about, the movement of live captive servants, the movement of carcasses across the landscape, where you've got the disease or potentially have the disease, concentrating them at food sources, providing minerals and, uh, and, and corn to concentrate them that exacerbates the spread. You know, not, not being willing to do some localized targeted culling. I mean, we know that can be effective in limiting prevalence. And so there are actions we can take that can, can hopefully help the long-term status of the deer herd. Hey, I'd like to add to that, you know, I'm, I'm one of those guys that cups always half full, but let's do everything we can to limit, you know, the spread and prevalence because some smart young scientists out there may come up with a cure or something like that. So let's all work together to limit the spread and prevalence and wait on the science to catch up. Right. Yeah, there's, you know, new things are found every day about prions. And if something somewhere down the line, you know, is developed, we can't treat the whole state if, you know, if we can still have very localized areas, maybe there's something we can do, but if it's throughout the entire state, that's just not possible. The reality here is we're talking about something that has the potential to devastate 
the white-tailed deer. And, you know, it's a $30, $40 billion economic engine. It's a huge cultural part of who we are, what we do. Um, and that's at risk. And then the other thing that's at risk, we met some with some legislators, legislators yesterday. Uh, the real concern is that our model of conservation is funded on the back of sportsmen. And sportsmen are after white-tailed deer. And so our whole system of conservation in North America is predicated largely on the success of the white-tailed deer. Yes. And if something jeopardizes and puts that, that herd at risk, um, all of the great things and the great successes that we have are at risk. The other side of it is the value of land and recreational land. You know, if if there aren't deer and turkeys there in Missouri for folks to chase or feel uh, comfortable hunting and eating, then what's the value of that land, too, and all the other things that benefit from it? So, you know, I think there's bigger bigger concerns here that of what the white-tailed deer means to us as Americans and our conservation success story. I think Mark started this very well when he started talking about the passion of, of white-tailed deer hunters. I mean, we're all really, really passionate about the sport of deer hunting, and I, and I think that's part of the reason that it's such a hot topic right now. You know, everybody wants to fix it, cure it as quickly as possible, but uh, I think Grant's explanation of how we do that and the four things that you mentioned or five things, uh, I guess we're all going to have to kind of dig in and, you know, put our heels in the ground and say this is what we got to do. And maybe that's the only way we can get her done is everybody in a cooperative effort. I would like to see something nationally uh, amongst all the states trying to formulate some type of, of uh, you know, board or something that could work cooperatively and, and really work on, on identifying these prions at an early stage and some some type of cure and i know maybe that's out of the question at this point talk about funding you know funding is a big big issue and a lot of states don't have the monies to do that but it would be nice if it could be a cooperative effort amongst all the states yeah funding's been a huge challenge you know in uh i don't know 2010 2011 somewhere in that time frame usda backed away from a lot of the funding that they were using to support surveillance work and so many of the states backed off of, of their just random, you know, surveillance in terms of determining distribution of the disease and, and how monitoring works. We as a state decided, no, we, it was not the responsible thing for us to be doing. And in fact, we've, we've increased our surveillance quite substantially. But, yeah, that, that additional funding source and the, and the needs for dollars at a, even at a national level to support it is, is critical. So that brings up a topic. It's it's not a direct question that I'm seeing here, but the, the whole the follow the trail of money or whatever, and, and people just don't have trust in government agencies, and they feel like somehow the insurance uh, lobbyists are got their you know their po- you know hands in your pockets or how I mean how do you guys answer that question because it also comes up all the time. Oh, it does, and I've heard, yeah, I've heard CWD linked to uh, insurance companies, and they'd be happy it's there because it kills deer, and there's fewer deer to get hit by cars, and and that, yeah, the insurance companies influence us on our management decisions, and I, you know, I can just say personally, um, you know, for seven years, I was our deer biologist and making management recommendations, and never once was I contacted by an insurance agency or anybody who worked for an insurance company about us doing something to reduce deer numbers i mean they they know what accident rates are they just work it in you know it's it's not a i can't say what happens in other state legislators you know legislatures we have the beauty of the conservation commission that has the authority to make rules um and so you know they may get other pressures that i'm not aware of but no we we don't we hear from the individual who has hit the deer not from the insurance (laughs) company so so I have a question from a guy from our hometown, and I'm going to paraphrase here because it, it, it's flown up and, and passed. But Nick Rozier, uh, and Saint Ge- we're from St. Genevieve County, which had some positives. Did you say six, six positives yes. this, this past hey, Nick. year? And, and so Nick, he <laughs> said neighbor. that he tried to um, ask this question uh, on one of your previous lives, I believe, and, and it never got answered. So I'm going to help him out here. And he, he wanted to know um, – what you guys are doing to kind of extend that olive branch to landowners, to hunters, to try to gain their trust back because there is that mentality across 
the state and, and many states that it's almost two different things working against each other. The, the hunter conservationists against the government agency that's set to control the whole, you know, whether you can bait, how many deer you can kill, all, all those types of regulations. So are you guys, what do you do to try to extend that olive branch and gain their trust? Because he fears that if you completely lose that trust, this battle to try to contain CWD, we may never win it. I'll provide a specific example. When we first found the disease in Macon County and Adair County, uh, intensive surveillance, we implemented targeted culling, we started removing deer in those local areas. Huge questions started being raised about, well, how do you know where the disease is? Have you done enough testing? Do you, do you know what the distribution is? You're asking us to kill deer, but how do you know that 20 miles down the road the disease, disease doesn't exist? And so in response to those landowners being directly impacted was one of the huge pieces of why we went to the mandatory sampling inside of the management zones was one to quit shooting deer in the winter for pure surveillance purposes those were we were responding to those are deer that hunters are already shooting can we can we get those and then two can we provide some assurance to those folks that were knocking on their door and asking to dump, come in and do targeted culling in the winter that they're the source of the disease and that's where the disease exists that it's not also five miles down the road or 10 miles down the road we don't have an idea what we're up against so i think directly that was a pure response to what we were hearing from those folks and their skepticism they were willing to help they were willing to participate but they needed that understanding that we had an understanding and grasp of where the disease was on the landscape okay one of the questions and i and i passed it up here in the name so i apologize for that but regarding baiting and what do you, what are what are the MDC's thoughts about how baiting is related to CWD specifically? Because you know a lot there's a lot of landowners and, and hunters that you know they use baiting as as a way to get pictures and recon in the summer months, and in, in some states obviously it's legal to hunt over bait. So that's a hot topic. How does baiting and CWD live together? Yeah, so I can take that. So yeah, um, placing any sort of very concentrated supplemental food source or mineral site on the landscape concentrates deer to a very, very small area on the landscape. And so deer will visit that, you know, generally it's a corn pile if you're wanting to get pictures in front of a trail camera or mineral block. Um, deer are going to visit that. Um, they're going to eat there, um, probably defecate and urin urinate there. They're going to leave their saliva on that corn or that mineral block. We all know that those are ways that the prions can be shed in the environment. And so that's a different situation than, say, a deer foraging in a food plot where it walks around and it's uh, picking leaves off of plants. And certainly those infective prions are going to be left on that leaf. But the chances that another deer are going to come in contact with that specific plant is much less than a very small pile of corn or mineral site on the ground. And so those contact rates between infected deer with non-infected deer are much higher risk at those very concentrated food sources. And so that's why we are worried about those supplemental food and mineral sites and those areas where we know CWD is likely to be transmitted or spread. And so that's one of the reasons that we pull back or we have that feeding and supplemental mineral ban in our CWD management zone counties. Do you foresee that continuing to spread each year, that those bans? That was a question that came through. If our CWD management zone spreads, then yes, then, okay. then we would implement those bans. Uh, kind of a, a, a follow-up on that, Pat uh, Strasser says, uh, congregation, uh, congregations always mention, seems to be the easiest fix. What is your stance on small food plots that generate massive congregation on a daily basis? She just addressed that. It's Yeah, I think it's just kind of the way they behave around yeah. those spots. I mean, you know, a, a salt lick may be the size of this table or typically smaller. You know, a, a food plot, if if it's not bigger than a quarter acre or a half acre, if you've got very many deer, it's not going to serve as a place to concentrate deer very long. You're going to have to have a, a bigger space to do that. Grant, do you have anything to add in that part of the discussion? I agree exactly with what they said. And also, you got to remember, you know, we got a soybean plant here and the deer nips it off. Well, deer is obviously not coming back to that same spot. Food plots are not the same as other forms of concentrating deer at all. Once that forage is gone, there's no reason for a deer to stick its nose right there again. And I guess I'd add to that, you know, we often get the question, what's the what's the biological basis of that and what's how do you support that? There there is a 
whole slew of peer-reviewed scientific articles that talk about the role of concentrating deer, especially when you look at uh, some of the research that was done on on tuberculosis in Michigan. And so there's there's clear definitive scientific evidence. This isn't just us us making up um, things because we're anti-baiting or something like that. There's a strong <coughs> biological and science-based background to that recommendation. Brandon Easley says, how is stopping baiting going to stop deer from seeing or eating? And he had an LOL. So, like, you know, that's a detractor as to, well, well know, yeah, we know, ever the, stop we know they're social animals, right? I mean, there's no doubt. You, we, we get the question about a licking branch, you know, whether they're going to, deer are going to frequent that, but how long are they going to do that? It's just a small few weeks, maybe a month time period in the fall. The salt lick deer at it all months of the year, you know, and so it's that continual reuse and it's large numbers. I mean, it's a common communal place. And so, the level of contamination, just the level of indirect contact that occurs there is just very, very different. And again, it gets back to what's the responsible thing to doing. We shouldn't be doing things that we know are directly detrimental. There are some natural things that we're not going to control, but, but we should be doing the responsible things that we as humans aren't making the problem worse. Jacob Broker asks, do we think the high populations that have been desired by hunters help to have caused this disease so of course we want a healthy deer herd a lot of deer to hunt a lot of deer to see and it's it's definitely grown in the last 30 40 years it, it seems like um so has has that been detrimental and, and actually hurt the, the cause here with cwd so that's a really complicated question we were talking about this a little bit earlier you know the disease is present in deer herds you know western nebraska and and wyoming and places like that where they've got three or four mule deer per square mile the disease is present and present at pretty high prevalence it's present in wisconsin at pretty high prevalence where at this point in time they've got relatively high deer densities and so it's really about the proportion of the deer in the population that are infected uh, more so than it is the actual number uh, we definitely know that you know high density populations you're probably going to get some longer dispersal distances and so you're going to get some more rapid spread of the disease definitely lowering of numbers when you do that if you got the disease present you're you're more likely to take out some of those infected individuals that exist but ultimately it really is driven by the frequency of the individuals in the population that are infected more so than than it is pure density itself and and again the disease is caused by the prion the number of deer on the landscape didn't cause it and that's what we talk about you know the spread of the disease in, in captive servants just holding captive deer inside of a fence doesn't mean they're going to get cwd it has nothing to do with it this infectious agent has to be introduced and that's the real kind of take-home messages it has to be introduced somehow so there's there's so many questions coming through it's hard to keep up before they come out of the screen i can't get back to it Mark, did you have any questions or Terry specifically for these guys that kind of... He basically answered the one that I was going to ask, you know, because uh, my farm's in Mercer County in Missouri and uh, we're now in the zone. So no more minerals. And uh, it took me from uh, allowing me as a non-resident to kill two does with a two antler deer or two antlerless deer instead of one. To me, that's you know counterintuitive to what we're hearing. Like I would think fewer deer would be a, a better you know a better you know state of the herd going forward. I'd just as soon control that herd myself and be allowed more antlerless deer and make good decisions. But with two, I mean, it's it's not a you know it's not a big big weapon there. I, I want to taking it from unlimited number of uh, antlerless firearms permits to one or two really does put a handcuff on the hunter. Because I think, and, and but you know, when you explain about the deer density, it kind of changes your mindset a little bit. But it's really, really hard to to wrap your hands around that, because you would think if the deer density is extremely high, it's going it, to the prevalence could the be landscape yes, quicker. Quicker. So I kind of understand it, but I, I'm with you. I want to increase those those antlerless permits. They went, they went the other way, and I think that was due to EHD. The numbers were down so low. Am I correct in that, when they yeah. changed some of the regulations? Yeah, in 2012. Bag so we, we changed bag limits in 2014 from the yeah. unlimited to, to one or two, depending upon the county, or zero. I mean, we still have a couple of counties we don't allow any firearms analyst permits. So you guys sort of fit into a unique situation where you have larger, larger land holdings and need that tool to be able to harvest some additional deer. I will say 
uh, we're working on uh, developing a deer management assistance program to pro- to work targeted with landowners, cooperative landowners, maybe in some larger blocks, but to provide that additional tool because the reality is is that most folks don't shoot more than a, a couple of well, most folks don't even shoot a deer, which is hard to believe. But but the actual usage of multiple antlers permits is pretty low. So how do we how do we fit that in with our high hunter densities and create these countywide stable populations? But as it comes to disease management, we're really looking at tiers. Where the disease is, we absolutely want to try to remove as many deer as possible because that next one what might be the infected one. So if we could magically remove all the infected deer, that's what we would do. Uh, but we've got to take these targeted culling approaches and, and in many cases target the female social group. Um, and I kind of keep going back to that. We've had positive deer that we found during the fall or found them during early during targeted culling and tried to identify the social group that deer came out of and go and target the rest of those individuals because those are the ones that are most likely to be infected it may not be the one that's two miles down the road so we're even kind of thoughtfully trying to very carefully decide which individuals we we remove but you get 15 20 miles away What's your risk? Your risk is a young male having dispersed. Mm-hmm. So that's why we've taken yeah. the antler point restriction off. It's not to say you need to shoot antlerless or young bucks that don't meet the antler point restriction, but it's to say those young males are the ones dispersing. So that's the way it may get to your farm more quickly. You at least should have the option of, of removing them. And so then that's why we liberalized a little bit too, is to provide some additional opportunity to harvest a few more antlerless deer to keep populations stable. Uh, provide some additional opportunity to harvest deer but it's kind of this kind of tiered approach our biggest concern is where we know the disease is then relatively close proximity within that 25 mile radius which is how we define a management zone and then out in the rest of the state where we know we don't have the disease we don't want to take away good deer management tools all right i'll I'll, uh, ask one more question and then we'll wrap things up and uh, let everybody have a chance to give their final thoughts so dustin prevo he he had a couple questions but uh, one we already answered as far as uh, can burning the remains uh, effectively dispose of it i I believe that's a no it's you can't get it hot enough to to actually kill that i believe it needs to be um above 1800 degrees fahrenheit which most folks are not gonna have that ability it's an incinerator all right, so um, he says that he, he, la- he manages several properties for camera analysis and uh, often spreads corn out to entice, entice the deer to stay longer, uh, obviously to get a better photo. Um, is this still a healthy choice, placing corn on the ground, or should we be um, uh, using feeders to keep them off the ground and away from feces and urine? I mean, we've talked about kind of stopping baiting in general but what about getting it off the ground as as opposed to it you know them being down you know yeah grant might be able to speak to that but i don't know that there's a feeder yet that's clean yeah and so (laughs) raccoons and all those kinds of things are spreading spreading corn and waste material on the ground and so that just essentially concentration there they're going to be picking around if if it's in the woods and there's some acorns there they're going to be picking around there's going to be some grass growing they're going to continue to to use that site and and interact with the environment well, it, would that, you know, based on the food plot example, if you choose to do winter feeding and you're still allowed to, would it not make more sense than to spread it as opposed to concentrate it? I mean, it's the same example as a large food plot versus a small little um, mineral site. Yeah, I think a broadcast spreading would probably be a more responsible strategy if you choose to do that. The other side is that deer don't necessarily need the supplemental food. You know, I mean, we think we're providing them a lot of benefit, but in, in most cases, they're not nutritionally deprived. You know, especially we talk about the fertile parts of Missouri and Iowa and Illinois and, you know, deep soils and really, really good nutrition. Deer automatically go through a, a nutrition deficit and kind of lose body weight in the winter anyway. So we think we're helping them, but in many cases, we're, we're not doing a whole lot. So you just kind of weigh the benefit of, of putting that stuff out there as to what the, the real data would suggest. Well, there's some supplemental feed manufacturers. We'd love to have that, that conversation. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Grant, you know, you touched on that many years ago about uh, supplemental feeding can be an adverse effect about them burning a certain amount of energy and not consuming, not replacing that energy in the, in the middle of the winter. I thought I'd get to stay out of a supplemental feeding argument. I (laughs) I opened the door, didn't I? 
<clears throat> well, it's a whole other topic. You yeah, know? I it mean, is. I, I supplement feed in the winter, you know, and I spread it. I don't, you know, I don't pile it. I spread it. So that's why I asked the question. You know? Yeah, in those situations, I don't think it's it's bad. I just, in a lot of scenarios, I just don't think most folks are are probably doing it to the scale that's really necessary to, to improve right, the condition right. of the Which herd. Which I do it to scale, you know, obviously. So I agree with that comment 100%. Yeah. Most folks that are just putting a bag or two out, that's an attraction. <laughs> to get a picture, right. a yep. Nutritional program. Yep. So to kind of wrap things up, Grant, I want to uh, – we got a guy who says – Brian Tafflinger says, the CWD hysteria is a scam. And I've been – uh, watching much like most hunters, you know, uh, Ted Nugent was just on uh, Joe Rogan's podcast and kind of talked about his, the historia, uh, hysteria, rather. And um, obviously, we've all seen the Jay Gregory live, and he's a friend of ours. And and we got a couple friends, Chris Parrish and and uh, David Westmore, the guys that we know are great hunters and and educated people. And and it it, it all no in respect. Yeah no end to respect you know it's not just know them we respect their opinions as hunters yeah yet they have uh, similar feelings kind of the the opposite feeling so grant what as a jumping off point what do you say to the thought or notion as a uh wildlife biologist that cwd is a the hysteria around it is a scam david and i've had this debate many times so david if you're listening we're going again but i got the mic this time uh cwd is for real uh, no deer herd has been known to go the other way and start recovering from it. Once it gets 20 30%, we're probably losing more deer to CWD than the, the population can breed in and replace itself. That deer herd is going to go down. There are absolutely herds in the West, mule deer herds, where hunters are being curtailed or not allowed as many tags, as many hunting days as they used to have. And, and that's been cooking for more decades. That can happen to whitetails nationwide. The bag limit could be drastically reduced for whitetails because of the amount of deer dying to CWD. And, and quite candidly, anyone that thinks CWD is a scan, I'm sorry, but you're just wrong. It's for real. It's not government-induced. I wish it was. I'd like to blame somebody. But it's for real. I'm extremely concerned about it. I used to always say habitat loss was the number one concern I had for whitetails. I'm kind of shifting as I mature and know more about this. CWD right now scares me more than anything. And the reason is I can take a stuff mark parking lot and with a little work grow vegetation there again and make it deer habitat. There's nothing known to man right now that can reverse CWD. Scary thought. Yeah. I, well said. Could, could, couldn't have said it better. I mean, I, you know, we've, dedicated our careers to you know understanding and you know the white-tailed deer in, in in different ways and and so i wish that this thing wasn't real but the cold hard reality is we're gonna have to swallow hard and deal with it um and and hopefully we can can come together to do those things that aren't making it worse and i'm actually gonna give david westmoreland a voice grant and a microphone because i did ask him a few questions hey if you had any questions to ask the mdc what would they be one of them was if mdc is that concerned with cwd why have they not reinstated mandatory check-in of all deer harvested for five years so they can actually see if it's spreading and how big of a problem it actually is so so we, we do have mandatory sampling in the chronic wasting disease management zone, um, and that's going to be in 31 counties this upcoming season, uh, and that's just for the opening weekend of firearm season. Um, and that last year we tested, oh, I think it was like 15,000 or 17,000 deer just from that effort alone. Total, we, we sampled um, 24,500 around that sample last year, um, and, and that's a lot if you compare other states to the number of deer that we sampled. Uh, but to sample every deer that's harvested in Missouri, which is around last year, 280,000 deer, we simply do not have the budget or ma manpower to sample that many deer. It does cost us, obviously, the, the, the test as well as the, um, you know, our labor um, and supplies to obtain those samples. So what we want to do is sam get the, the, the biggest bang for our buck is why we target those uh, chronic wasting disease management zone counties to monitor the spread of the disease. And then we also do statewide surveillance with, throughout the state where we work with cooperating taxidermists 
Um, and we do compensate them to sample deer for us. And by working with taxidermists, we are selecting generally the older age males in the population. And we know that CWD, if it's present, does tend to have a higher prevalence in older age males. So it's kind of a weighted sampling technique by doing it that way. And again, we're getting more for our money by looking throughout the state and looking at those animals that are or more likely to have the disease. We're really looking for a needle in the haystack. And, and by selecting those older age males, it gives us a higher chance of finding it if it's present um, early in the disease uh, process. Is that brain tissue or is it spinal or both brain tissue? Uh, they're actually lymph nodes that are located in the neck of the deer. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think that's one of the misconceptions is that, you know, we've just started looking for it. We began surveillance for CWD in 2002. 2002 to 2004, we collected 22,000 samples statewide which gave us a pretty good handle on that if the disease was here, it was present at very, very low prevalence. And so since that time, as Barb indicated, we've continued that kind of statewide approach of adult males trying to make sure that we detect the disease if it pops up, but then in the management zones doing very, very intensive surveillance. So, yeah, it's a serious problem, um, but we to date, we're over, what, over 100,000 deer that we've sampled for CWD. Next to Illinois and Wisconsin, there probably isn't anybody that's tested more deer for CWD than us. What so, year was our first positive? 2010 in a captive servant facility 2010. in Lynn okay. County. And our first free-ranging positive was a deer that was harvested in the fall of 2011, and we got the test results in 2012. And how 2012. many positives has Missouri had, and what is the ratio between captive versus free-range? Uh, to date, we know of uh, 11 captive, and we're up to 75 free-ranging. Okay. You know, the challenge is captive service facility, you can go and eliminate all those deer, and they're gone. Uh, free-ranging populations, once the cat's out yep. of the bag and it's spreading, being able to remove all those live animals from the landscape is extremely difficult. Mm -hmm. You know, another question I hear all the time is our, our comment, people go, it's been here for years, they're just now discovering it. I hear that one all the time. Yeah. Could, could you t speak to that perhaps, Grant? Yeah, I'd be glad to. If we look at that map, that US, uh, the USGS map, it was found in very isolated areas in Colorado and Wyoming, and nothing was done, and look at the spread. So it hasn't been here forever. If it's been here forever, that spread would have occurred long, long ago. Uh, I, that's just not an accurate statement. It's spreading. We look at Pennsylvania, it's spreading. We look at Wisconsin, it's spreading. Once the disease is present, it spreads. And we would have been picking it up, like Jason said, when we started testing in Missouri, would have been picking it up then at a much higher prevalence rate. Arkansas missed it. And once they started testing, it was late. It was 20 plus percent prevalence. So that's not an accurate claim that's been here forever. That's, that's misleading and doing damage to conservation efforts. Based on its current rate of spread, what do you think the future looks like, Grant? Well... Again, I'm a cup half full type guy. I really believe that there'll be some research or something that will come around to either help us contain it or even reduce it. But I feel 100% confident in this statement. If we did nothing, if we followed the conspiracy theory that some people have, it's nothing, and you know the government and biologists trying to run our hunting. If we did nothing, I believe probably not in my lifetime, but maybe at the later part of my kid's lifetime white-tailed deers would be very rare or extinct. Uh, it, this, this disease could cause extinction in white-tailed deer. And the last couple minutes of our conversation is probably getting the most negative. I mean, it's, you know, people are saying, it's a joke, this is a circus, this is a laugh fest. And, you know, we're here to lend you all a voice, but we're not, we're not doing this to spread an agenda. We're trying to just really help showcase some of the science and research done by people in the know um that we have nothing to gain by this you know there's some great testimony. let them laugh i mean that's, you know we're not doing it for any other reason well, other than it, we care about the resource greatly it's pretty sad though that you're not open-minded enough to understand we've got some we've got a problem qualified people here that can help enlighten us and educate us all and you know and not take it seriously is, is kind of a shame really yeah it you is know? Hey, folks, it's real simple. I don't want it on my land. Gosh, I make a living with deer. My kids are named after deer, literally. Mark knows I'm passionate about deer. Uh, but we have a, where I live, a small, I think about 60 landowners that are not adjacent, uh, touching landowners, a, a deer co-op. There's no money changing hands. It's just we get together twice a year and share antlers and stories and how to build food plots, whatever. And our co-op has volunteered 
to collect samples this year of all the deer, bow harvest, does, bucks, whatever, and look for CWD because we realize it's that important to detect it early to take the appropriate steps. Well said. Well said. Actually trying to do something about it. Yeah. <laughs> Which th- you just said a mouthful there, doing something about it versus just talking about it. There's two different things. There are two different approaches, and we applaud you for doing that, Grant, for taking that initiative. And, and there's no currently there's no way to find out if they're positive without them being dead first, right? Correct. I mean, that's the, that's yep. an, the issue, right? Yep. We have to extract lymph nodes. Yeah. No live test, and you can't tell by looking at them until it's way, way too late. And then you're not certain. Then you don't know what it is. Right. That's no the life. frustrating part. You know, you, you you wish you had better answers. You wish you had something. You know, it's just a, it's a devastating disease, and, and it's a it's a hard reality to, to swallow. And that, um, It's I mean, tricky I, to be sure. Yeah, I, mean, I grew up wanting to be the state deer biologist and got a chance to do it. And then what do you <laughs> congratulations. do? Congratulations. Yeah, congratulations. You got CWD and you got to tell everybody that, <laughs> that we've now got this disease that's going to decimate. And yeah, they hate you. Has the potential to do it. <laughs> right. yeah, but, hey, yeah. You know, What's so the saying? Careful what you wish for. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's just a struggle. And, you know, come in, Barb, for Billy and Willing to take that responsibility yes. over now, you know. But, you know, we wish we had better answers, but we don't. Um, Are there any silver linings to this? I mean, do you have some success with your your, your program with MDC? Yeah, I think the silver lining and, you know, glass half full, uh, just like Grant, that, you know, where we have first found the disease in the free-ranging herd in Macon County and then subsequently in Adair County with great cooperation and tremendous sacrifice by those, by those landowners that are there locally, their willingness to, to go ahead and remove additional deer, allow us to remove additional deer. We see the same thing that Illinois has seen. We are seeing very stable prevalence. We're at like 2 to 4% in about a 30 or 40 square mile area. Still, you can pinpoint the farms where we're likely to get positives coming from. We're slowly seeing a little bit of geographic spread, which is, is the concern of, of how do we manage that long term. But there's still deer there. They're still killing deer. Uh, not at high numbers, not what they were, um, but we've not decimated the population in the remainder of the counties or the remainder of the state in, in our response to that. So, yeah, there's some success stories there. We've, we've found a couple spots where we've only had one positive. We continue to do surveillance and try to see if, if there's additional positives there, and so we'll be responding to those as we continue to find or don't find the disease, hopefully. So, yeah, I think management can work. We know a lot about the disease. We know a lot more than we did in 2000. Um, and how to apply the appropriate management actions. It's just that those management actions just are tough. Those are really, really tough decisions. And thankfully we're not at the point yet where we are seeing a lot of sick deer on the landscape, like in the core area of Wisconsin, some areas out west. Um, But the message I try to give to landowners in areas, in the core areas where we do have the disease, is that if we're successful, you're probably gonna see less deer on the landscape, but we hope that for the long term, those are healthy deer. If we were to do nothing, you're, you you wouldn't notice a difference for maybe you know five or ten years, but eventually you're going to see more and more sick deer, um, and at that point there's nothing we can do. Well, on a positive note, at least there is a silver lining. Should we? Uh... Yeah, I think um, let's wrap it up. I mean, we're not going to solve all the world's problems in one podcast, obviously. But it was very educational. Your guys' yes. opinions and thoughts are are valued by this group and I hopefully by the audience that you know out there on Facebook Grant we want to thank you and absolutely Jason and Barb it was very very informational and educational well appreciate you guys giving us the opportunity to to reach out and answer many of this you know the tough questions we get it's the same ones it's there's there really aren't very many new questions when it comes to this we hear them a lot and so appreciate you guys giving us the the opportunity to reach out to your audience can't thank you enough absolutely All right, well, for this edition of the Drury Outdoors 100% Wild Podcast, we appreciate everybody tuning in. As always, you can check us out over on the Drury Outdoors YouTube channel and uh, anywhere that podcasts are available for listening. You can subscribe and and catch all the things we're up to. So uh, I think that does it for us here at the Drury Outdoors studio. Until next time, thanks for watching.